Okay. All right. All right. Okay, so we will be starting then uh, here with harmful landscapes. Um, and uh, I wanna begin a little bit with the history of this work. Um, in about 1980, this gentleman here, Dr. Vincent Felitti, was running a clinic for people who were morbidly obese. These were individuals who were weighing anywhere from 400 to sort of 600 pounds, uh, US pounds. Uh, and he had developed a method where he was able to take people with that kind of weight down by 80 or so percent. They were dropping weight to maybe in the hundreds, uh, 200 pounds over the course of one year. Needless to say, with that type of ed, uh, change in their body weight, he was constantly monitoring other aspects of their health so that if something changed, he could be well equipped to help them uh, deal with health issues. There was a woman named Patty who, when she came into his clinic, weighed about 430 pounds, and within the course of about a year, was down to about 140 pounds. Over the course of about a few months, she began to gain weight back, and Dr. Felitti asked her, uh, Patty, is there something going on that might explain the change in weight? The first thing she said was, well, this is going to sound a little bit strange, um, but I live alone and I go to sleep. And when I wake up in the morning in the kitchen, there seems to be pots and pans and food all around. I seem to be eating in my sleep. He said, well, that's that's not completely unusual. That, that can happen. Anything else going on? Well, she said, well, I'm having a, a sexual relationship with a, an older coworker at my job. Felitti says, well, how do you feel about that? She says, well, I don't feel so great about that. Why is that? Because when I was a child, I was raped by my grandfather. So Felitti paused, obviously, from this remarkable comment that he had really, in some ways, never heard. But more importantly for him specifically, as a doctor, he had never asked any of his patients about their childhood experiences. He then proceeded to ask everyone in the clinic about that kind of experience and found out that 80% of the individuals in this clinic for people who were morbidly obese had a history of sexual abuse. He then went to a conference for doctors who were focusing on eating disorders. So these are professionals. And he presented his work. And the doctors, in some ways, almost laughed him off the stage. They said, come on, these people are making up excuses for their weight. They didn't have any adverse experiences. Felitti was shocked that he would get this kind of response from professionals. That night at dinner, he was sitting next to a man who was a, a member of the Centers for Disease Control. And the man said, listen, I don't know if you're right or wrong, but if you're right, we have a real problem on our hands because it's possible that adverse childhood experiences might be um, responsible for certain kinds of health problems. At that point in time, Felitti joined forces with another uh, doctor, Dr. Robert Anda, and they created what became known as the Adverse Childhood Questionnaire. The idea was they were going to ask individuals about three kind of broad categories of adversity that an individual may have experienced between the age of birth to 18. They asked them whether they had, for example, physical abuse, sexual abuse, or emotional abuse as different types of abuse. They asked them about neglect. Were you physically neglected, emotionally neglected? Or might you have had some kind of household dysfunction like substance abuse, divorce, mental illness, incarceration, or a mother treated violently? Okay. The questionnaire was very simple. And this is basically what the questionnaire looked like. It asked, while you were growing up during the first 18 years of your life, for example, question one, did a parent or other adult in the household often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? 
If the answer to that question was yes, you would put a score of one for that question. Well, I'm just going to lower my shade. And so forth. So you went through these 10 questions of different kinds of adversity. And so at the end, you would add up the number of ones. The maximum score on this type of questionnaire would be a 10. The minimum, of course, would be a zero. You've had none of these adversities. So Felitti um, gave this to, and what I want you to notice about these questions, and I'm going to zoom in on one, is this is one about physical abuse that was asked, were you pushed, grabbed, slapped, or th had something thrown at you? Or were you hit so hard that you had marks or were injured? Notice here that there's no distinction. If you had any of these, you still got a one. So it could be maybe a parent just pushed you or they hit you so hard that they actually injured you. Okay, Those were not distinguished. Any one of those would indicate a one. Okay. I'm mentioning that here because I want you to think about how these doctors are thinking about childhood adversity, okay? All right, so that was the questionnaire that was administered to individuals coming into a health a hospital for checkups. And so they had also information on these individuals that had to do with possible outcome measures. Like, did they have a problem with physical activity or were they smokers or alcoholic or drug use? Did they miss work frequently? Uh, did they have a suicide attempt? Were they depressed, diabetes, cancer? So they were collecting many different types of behavioral, physical and mental health issues that may or may not have been related to the types of experiences they had at children. Okay, so information on adverse childhood experiences or ACEs is the acronym and possible health outcomes. What they found was something that is very much analogous to what you see in both pharmacology kind of or drug testing, where you have what's called a dose response. The way to read this graph is the horizontal or x-axis is the dose, right, from zero all the way up, okay? And the y response or axis or vertical axis is the level of the response, okay? And what you're seeing here is when the doses is kind of low, you get very little response, but at some point, the response, sort of toxic response, begins to pick up, and as you can see, it moves exponentially. So as you get these higher doses, you start to get worse and worse responses. And that's precisely what they found with the number of ACEs. As the number of ACEs picked up, so too did the health risk to the individuals. Let me show you specifically what they found. Okay. About 17,000 patients, Kaiser was the hospital. It was a hospital uh, in the Southern California area of the United States, okay? 17,000 individuals reported on their ACE scores, and here's what Felitti and his colleagues found. Two-thirds of all the participants had at least one ACE, one adverse child experience. 20% had three or more. But here is where it became extremely interesting and surprising in many ways. Individuals with four or more ACEs had extraordinarily higher risk of some of the most important mental health issues, medical health issues known to mankind. A 240% increase in heart disease probability a 190% increase in the risk for cancer, 1,030% increase in the probability of a drug abuse problem, so forth and so on. Stroke, diabetes, suicide attempt, obesity, and depression. In other words, as the number of those ACEs increased, so too did these health risks. For six or more ACEs, life expectancy decreased by almost 20 years. When Felitti and his colleagues published this, it sent a shockwave through the medical community. 
No one had really ever seen risk factors like this before, and nor had most doctors bothered to ask patients about childhood experiences. Okay, this was published in 1998. Here we are today, 2024, right? Uh, 26 years later. Okay, what has happened? The first is that the World Health Organization got a hold of these results and said, look, we may have a health crisis on our hands, and maybe this is unique to California, maybe it's global. So they began to administer the ACEs questionnaire across the United States and in other countries. The key result covering now 20 plus years of research is that ACEs are not unique to Southern California, nor to the US, nor to poorer countries, nor to wealthier countries, nor to democracies, nor to dictatorships, nor to certain religious groups or non-religious groups nor educated, nor uneducated. There were no correlations in that sense. ACEs are present throughout the world, irrespective of many key demographic factors. Okay. What I want to share with you today is that we've learned a lot since this early exposure that some members of the medical community and educational community have come across. But this work is still not well understood or known by people who ought to know, including teachers, social workers, doctors, nurses, and therapists. But we must move beyond this, and here's where I wanna take us to a new level. The first thing is adversity was in some sense defined by the original study as these things that happen within a family, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, physical neglect, and what was called family dysfunction. But there are many other kinds of adversity that a child may be exposed to, like community violence, poverty, war, discrimination, bullying, oppression, disease, many other kinds of adversity that can affect child development. So it's clear that we have to go beyond those original types. Second point, childhood was defined as birth to the age of 18. I know that um, Eunice has been talking to you about certain aspects of development in this class. Things are happening developmentally before birth, so prenatally. And as some of you may already know, there are lots of important brain development issues that are happening after the age of the 18. As I will come to explain in a moment, the frontal lobes of your brain are continuing to develop at least until the age of 23 to 25, well beyond that 18 year old period. Thirdly, experience wasn't really defined, but we know that some kinds of adversity may last only a short period of time. They may be defined, for example, loss of a parent. That parent dies, very traumatic for most children, if not all children. But after that, you now have perhaps one parent gone or both parents gone if it was disease. And now neglect may last for a very long time. And so it's important to think about the length of time that adversity lasts, because that's a dimension that may affect child development. Okay. The fourth point I want to make, and this is probably very relevant to all of you listening today, some of you may be thinking, well, I've had this kind of adversity. Am I now susceptible to those kinds of health risks? Here's an extremely important point that has often been missed by people who have used the ACEs questionnaire in work as a screening device. The ACEs questionnaire, when it was developed, was never intended as a tool to screen for individual health risks. Unlike when you go to a doctor and let's say get a blood draw and they say, you have high cholesterol, that's a screening tool for cholesterol at the individual level. 
or based on your genetics uh, and, or blood type that we've drawn, you have cancer. Those are screening tools for individuals. The ACEs questionnaire was intended as a population measure. In other words, a population of individuals who have four or more ACEs are in general more at risk for certain kinds of health diseases. That's important because in certain parts of the world, the ACEs questionnaire has been used, mistakenly, many believe, for policy and insurance. For example, in California, the state of California in the United States, there are health insurance policies that dictate that if you have four or more ACEs, you have a different kind of coverage than if you have three or less, zero to three. That's saying that you as the individual, we are determining your health coverage based on your a score. And what I want to share with you today is that's a mistake. And it's a mistake for several reasons. One, it was never intended as a screening device for individuals. But second, and more importantly for today, it's about adverse childhood experiences, not individuals' responses to those experiences. So let me now move us into a distinction which is fundamental for today. And that's the difference between an experience and your response to experience. ACEs, as the acronym states, are adverse childhood experiences. We don't know anything from that about how individuals will respond to those experiences. Here's a distinction. Some individuals respond to adversity with traumatic responses. Trauma coming from the Greek word of scarring. In other words, their bodies and brains are scarred by those experiences. Those are traces, traumatic responses to adverse childhood experiences. But other individuals with the exact same ACEs respond with resilience. In other words, they bounce back from the adverse childhood experiences or races. So let's keep in mind the distinction between experience and response. And on the response level, traumatic responses as opposed to resilient responses, okay? And that moves us into the second part, in some ways, the second part of the talk, which is now thinking about trauma. So here, I want to introduce to you, especially those of you who have been hearing what Dr. Menja has been talking about in terms of development, is that there are five different kinds of adverse dimensions, and they all begin by the letter T, and you've already heard about the first one. The first type of adverse dimension is the type of adversity. Was it abuse? If so, what kind? Physical, emotional, or sexual? Was it poverty or war or domestic violence, right? What type of adversity was the child exposed to? Second, timing. When did it occur during development? Did it happen when the child was very young, prenatally, one-year-old, two-year-old, 16-year-old, right? When during development did it happen? As many of you know, there are critical or sensitive periods of development where if certain experiences don't occur or if bad ones occur, it may throw off various aspects of the developing child. So timing, when did it occur? Second dimension. Third dimension, tenure. How long did it last? Remember, it was short experiences, long experiences. Did it last for all of early childhood? Did it occur during young adulthood, the teenage years? When did the adversity occur? How long? Okay. That's the third dimension. Fourth dimension, what I call turbulence. How predictable or controllable was the adversity? A father 
who may be drunk and comes home and is very abusive, may be completely unpredictable and uncontrollable for a young child. That's highly ambiguous, highly unpredictable, and highly uncontrollable. Whereas a child living in poverty, it's horrible and difficult, but it may be completely predictable, meaning that every day is difficult. I don't know if I'm going to get the food I need. I don't know if I'm going to be sleeping in the same place. So it's predictable, even though it's not controllable. And then lastly, toxicity. How severe was it? Remember in the uh, magnifying example I pulled out of physical abuse, there was no distinction between a, a slight push versus a child who's hit so hard that they're injured. That severity makes a difference. It makes a difference to the health outcomes, right? A child who is physically abused severely is different than a child who's, for example, may push from time to time, okay? Both are not good, but the toxicity level is different, okay? So here are five different dimensions of adverse experiences. And the point we're making as we move into the second part is those may well shape the traumatic response that a child has. Okay. So I'm just gonna make a quick pause here. And Eunice, if there are some questions that have come up in the chat, that I can answer here, this might be a good time to pause and address some of those questions if you have some. Any questions, Eunice? No, I don't see, I don't see any questions. Okay. All right, then I'll continue. I, um, I might be wrong because uh, I, I don't know you being a co-host. I'm not able to see the chats. I don't know why. You can't see the, the, the display? I, I'm, I'm not able to see the chats. I'm just admitting people. So um, I'm not sure. let, me, let me try. I'll, I'll, I'll start sharing again. You, because Is anybody else said anything about the chart, the, the slides? Uh, let me show you now. Let's see if we can do that. Um, yeah, I don't see the chat, but I... How yeah. about right now? How about now? Mm, like like the chat where they are asking the messages, I'm not. I'm, I mean... Where oh, the, the chat. You can't see the chat? Yeah, I can't. I'm, I'm able to see your screen, All I, but I'm okay. not seeing where the students are writing. Okay. Um, let me see. If I'll just... Part. Unless one of the students can unmute themselves and tell us, Agnes Macau. Um, I don't see any. I don't see any questions either. Okay, maybe they're not. Okay. Okay. Oh, here, here's here's one. Let me respond. To this one: If a child is beaten for disciplinary issues, is it an ace? Um, that's a terrific question. Um, and let me give you a short response. One of the things that's extremely important about the adverse child experience. Uh, questionnaire is there are huge cultural differences and the disciplinary issue is an important one. Um, in Kenya, um, as I'm aware of, and of course, as many of you are aware of, um, I think it was in 2016 that it was kind of legally, uh, in, you know, you were not allowed as a teacher to hit a child or cane a child. Now, clearly, that's stopped in many cases, but it's still happening. I'm still seeing reports, obviously, in places like the nation where that's happening in certain schools. In the United States, corporal punishment is legal in 19 of our 50 states. The reason why that's a great question is because a child who is living in an environment where, for example, physical discipline is okay, they're probably not going to score that as an ace because that's part of the norm of the society when i was a child about nine years of age i was living in france and in france a teacher taking a ruler and smacking a child who was being inappropriate unexpected behavior was perfectly part of the norm so if i had that question at that point i said well 
That's what teachers do when they discipline us, they hit us. Um, so that's an important piece because what counts as physical abuse may be interpreted differently by different children. The same goes for neglect. What a child living in uh, New York City or Nairobi uh, considers to be neglect might be very different than a child living in a rural area in Kenya or the United States. I think also so, the, I think also the, I think um, I can add on to that because the discipline level also matters. Yes. Um, you know, there are some teachers that will definitely not just hit you on, on your palm, they will hit on your back and everywhere else. So yes. the level and uh, the frequency also matters a lot. Yes. So very good. So it's, and again, this comes back to the adverse T's, right? So the toxicity, um, the same would be true for emotional abuse, right? I mean, I can remember being, you know, in various schools in the United States where I would ask a question and the teacher would say, why are you asking such a stupid question? Okay. <laughs> That's a form of emotional abuse. I didn't think of it that way, but it is right. You're stupid. So again, the severity of it um, is going to matter. As you mentioned, Eunice, the frequency, how often does it happen? There is nothing in the ACE questionnaire about frequency or toxicity. These are all dimensions that can greatly shape these traumatic signatures. Okay, so excellent question. Um, very important to have a cultural lens on the interpretation of the adversity. Okay, all right, excellent. So let's move into the trauma piece. Um, and if all of you who are on can mute yourself, that would be great. Yeah, I'm yeah, I muted them. I don't know who is unmuted. Can you please? Okay, I'll just, mute? I can do it. I think I just muted you, Eunice. <laughs> okay. Um, oops, we'll go back to you here. All right, there we go. Um, okay, so traumatic signatures. So in the same way that we all have unique um, fingerprints that define our signatures in some ways of who of us as individuals, um, the same thing is true for the brain. Um, we all develop unique signatures of who we are. We have a sense of self, our identity, right? And that is shaped by both our biology and the individual experiences that we have. So as we develop, we develop a sense of self, um, of who we are. And even though that sense can change over time due to different experiences, um, that sense of who we are as individuals becomes unique. It becomes imprinted upon us based on our biology and based on our experience. What I wanna share with you today is that there are different processes in the brain which shape that individuality. And again, both biology and experience. There are some processes of the brain, cognitive processes, that are what we call domain general. In other words, things like memory, attention, self-control, planning and learning, those processes or systems happen with all kinds of experience. I can remember a face, I can remember a social interaction, I can remember a mathematical equation, I can remember the definition for certain words. And the same thing is true for attention, self-control, planning and learning. All those processes can operate with different kinds of experiences in different domains, okay? So they are domain general. There are also domain specific processes which link to very specific kinds of experiences. So morality, knowing what's right or wrong, there's certain kinds of experiences that are very important for the moral domain. If I hit somebody intentionally, that's wrong, right? If I do it in self-defense, that's a different kind of view. So what we treat as right or wrong is a very specific kind of experience. What's often called a theory of mind is our way of thinking about, in a social world, our intentions, our desires, our beliefs. And again, what counts as a belief is something I believe about. I believe that you are all students who are here to hopefully learn, right? I have a theory about what you may or may not know. You have a theory about what I may or may not know, okay? But it's very specific. 
mathematics, number systems, what's bigger or smaller, more or less, ratios. Those are all very specific kinds of experiences. The same is true of language. We know they're specific because there are certain parts of the brain that activate or are active when those systems are engaged. And if those systems are damaged, for example, due to an accident or due to certain kinds of traumatic experiences, those systems can go down. They can be delayed or they can be broken permanently. Okay, so I want you to think about this idea between general and specific, because what you will soon learn is different kinds of adverse childhood experiences can impact both of these processes, both domain general and domain specific. Okay, so just for today, and again, just to introduce you to some of these ideas, I'm going to focus on neglect and abuse as two broad types recognizing, as we've already discussed, is that there are different kinds of neglect, physical, emotional, social, cognitive, and there are different types of abuse, which we'll talk about, physical, sexual, and emotional. Okay, let's talk about neglect and attachment. One of the most fundamental relationships that all children who are developing in typical and healthy environments is between mother and child, father and child, okay? Attachment is fundamental to child development. And often that development is what's feeding the development of the brain and especially the area I've highlighted in yellow here, the frontal lobes of our brain. This is kind of the seat of where those domain general processes sit. Memory, attention, planning, self-control, okay? Those areas in the frontal area are critical, and that early attachment relationship builds that system very powerfully. It depends on what is often considered like a tennis match between mother and child. Baby serves up a need, and mother and father return that need in synchrony, right? A tennis match isn't, I serve, and then you wait for an hour and return the ball. You return it in response. So serve, return, hit, return, hit, return. In synchrony, match to the baby's needs. That doesn't mean that every need a child serves should be responded by a parent. If a three-year-old says, I need a smartphone, a parent responds that that may not be the right kind of response, right? Certain needs like, I'm hungry, I'm crying because I'm hungry, or I'm sitting on the ground lifting my hands up because I want to be picked up, right? Those are the kinds of expectations and needs that a mother or father should respond to because when it's synchrony and when the child's needs are being met in that way, that frontal lobe develops, their sense of self develops, their security and confidence about a safe environment develop. But when they don't have those needs met, the environment seems unsafe. Their curiosity goes down because they never know if their needs are going to be met. And things can go very, very badly. Okay. So let's talk about neglect based on a study that was done starting the 1990s, where we've learned an extraordinary amount about what happens. In 1990, a uh, television program in the United States called 2020 visited Romania and discovered what was happening as a result of the then president who had been disposed, Nicholas Ceausescu, in Romania. There were all these orphanages, or in the sense of uh, Kenya, children's homes, with thousands and thousands of orphans who were discovered in very, very minimalist orphanages, often with six to seven children packed into a crib in very impoverished environments. And what they saw here was something that was shocking. It was described by the documentary as a Nazi concentration camp for children. That's how bad off those children were. The 
Um, scientists who you see here at the bottom were invited in to try to understand not only what the consequences of neglect were for child development, but what might help to allow these children to recover from neglect. So these three scientists, Charles Nelson, Charles Zena, and Nathan Fox, started a long-term study comparing children who remained in the orphanage with those who were raised by their biological parents so they could see what was different between children developing in more typical environments with their parents as opposed to those who remained within the orphanage. And they were looking at these different dimensions, type, clearly neglect, timing, different aspects of how long it was happening during development. For many of these children, the neglect happened for a long period of time. Some were moved into foster care or adopted um, and were put into better environments, so it may have been shorter. Turbulence, for many of these children, completely unpredictable and uncontrollable and highly toxic, very severe deprivation or neglect. Here's a quick summary of what they found, comparing again, those who remained in the orphanage versus those raised by biological parents. For those who remained in the orphanage, they saw highly stereotyped behavior, pacing, thumb sucking, self-injury, low physical growth. 10% of these children showed no attachment whatsoever. This was a shock to many developmentalist systems because it was believed that attachment was innate. Any child wanted to attach to some adult, right? But 10% showed no desire for attachment at all. The other 90% showed poor, what's often called disinhibited. They would attach to anybody or very reactive responses to social relationships. They also presented these children with a kind of computerized task. It was a reward task. If they saw a crocodile sort of going across the screen and there was a star and they pressed a key, the star fell and they got a reward. Could they do that? Okay. They also gave them a little number task. Four, three, two, one, they had to hit the key. Four, three, two, one. If it was one, two, three, four, they had to hit those keys in order. So it's kind of a number task motor response to number, okay? At the age of 12 to 13 years of age, this was done when these were young teenagers, they found that those children who were in the orphanage for that long showed a significantly poor uh, performance on the reward task and equally a significantly poorer response on this motor number task. These systems for these computerized tasks are simple association. See a star, hit a key. See numbers, hit a key. Just simply remaining within the orphanage left these children unable to do the most basic form of learning by association, okay? Following them further on in life when they were young teenagers, they found at the ages of eight, 12, and 16 years of age, they saw a significant increase in psychiatric disorders, depression, continued depression, uh, attachment problems, problems with language, problems with peer relationships, problems with learning and memory, and low motivation. In other words, summarizing this slide, staying within the orphanage for eight, 12, 16 years left these children with major psychiatric disorders, major problems of attachment, major problems of language, social relationships, learning and memory, and motivation. Okay, so just think about that. That seems to be a signature of response or trauma to neglect. What about abuse and fear? There are many different types of threat that one might be exposed to an environment, a predator, human or non-human animal, diseases, other people, dis uh, climatic issues, storms, severe drought, sounds in the environment. All those can trigger 
a fear response. We're afraid of these things. How we respond when we are afraid might be very, very different. So how do we avoid that fear? Okay. So threat avoidance might lead some to run away. If there's a threat, can I run away from it? If there's a threat, could I fight back? If I think I can beat something up that's aggressing towards me, maybe I can fight back. A third response is simply to freeze. Many individuals who feel overwhelmed by a dominant force might simply freeze, hoping that that threat goes away. And a fourth response is to feign injury or death, not move at all, seem like you are dead. Okay? These are different types of, again, responses to the adversity of abuse. So how are individuals responding? So let me walk you through the three different types of abuse. Actually, Eunice, I think this is eight o'clock. Um, maybe what we'll do, um, since I know we potentially have another opportunity to meet again, is pause yeah. here um, and we can set up another time for me to continue um, since we've had a little few challenges here. Okay, that sounds that sounds perfect, uh, Dr. Mark. I just want to say we're truly fortunate to have you this morning. I know you're rushing to something else, uh, and we we'll let you go. Uh, but I want to thank you so much for sacrificing your time. Yeah, it's my pleasure. No, and I'm delighted to do that. And so let's we'll find another time to continue continue this and then hopefully we can yes. both continue with some more content um, yes. and then open it up to questions from the students which I'd love to have. Yes and I'm gonna stay behind uh, with them so that we can do some housekeeping um, but I would like maybe the class rep to probably unmute herself and say our oh, uh, thank you on behalf of our classmates for one minute. Gadoni, are you there or any other student that's Feel like they want to give her uh, so thank you don't don't embarrass me guys <laughs> can someone unmute themselves and talk i see they're unmuted gadoni do you want to say something <laughs> okay. Are you saying something? That, that's that's fine. Uh, just just being here is a good enough thank you for me. <laughs> okay. I can I can see um, Kanyengitha says something there. So that's nice. Thank you very much. Um, it's been great having you all here today. Um, I look forward to our next session together. Um, and Eunice, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop this so you probably will lose everybody because I have to un get out of here. Um, so I'll stop the recording and send it to you. Um, oh.